If the plague asks you for a crown, give it too, and it may go away. Around 800 BC, the Mediterranean was littered with Phoenician settlements. The Phoenicians came from what is today known as Lebanon, where their five main ports of Tripolis, Byblos, Beirutus, Sidon and Tyre were in continual rivalry for commercial supremacy and from where they sailed along the coasts of the countries bordering on the Middle Sea. The Phoenicians also occupied the cities of Semira, Zarafath, Jubail, and Arwad. These city-states and their inhabitants were not in a unified state, but rather a group of city kingdoms. The Phoenicians themselves were also known as Sidonians or Tyrians, that is coming from Sidon and Tyre. Both Homer and the Bible refer to the Phoenicians as Sidonians. The Phoenicians took advantage of their geographical position between Egypt and Mesopotamia, which was regarded as a market hub in those times. Herodotus, inspired by the priests of Melkart, claims that the Phoenicians came from Eritrea, but nobody knows exactly whether they came from the Persian Gulf the island of Delmon in Bahrain, or from the Eritrea area of Asia Minor. It is not certain what the Phoenicians called themselves in their own language. It appears to have been Kenani, Kenana, Canaanites, and Canaan was the region of origin itself, a region that covers the whole of the Syro-Palestinian area. In Hebrew, the word Kenani has the secondary meaning of merchant, a term that well characterizes the Phoenician traits. St. Augustine referred to peasants coming from this region as Canaani. Cuneiform texts of the second millennium show that the word Canaan is also linked with the concept of purple red. The Phoenician alphabet consisted of 22 letters with no vowels. It is considered as the mother of modern writing. Alphabetic writing was already well established in the late Bronze Age at Ugarit, where a cuneiform script was used. Studies have shown that the Phoenician alphabet appeared in Byblos around the 14th century before Christ. According to Maria Luisa Oberti in the book The Phoenicians, she states that the glassmaking industry was handed down from the Mesopotamians. Ignoring the etiological myth of the Phoenicians inventing glass, advanced by ancient writers, it is easy to understand why they were able to take over the technique of manufacture and become the primary producers of glass in the Mediterranean. According to Hardin and Barak, the resuscitation and flowering of this craft during the Iron Age in the 7th and 6th century BC can be traced to the arrival of a Mesopotamian glassmaker on the island of Rhodes. In 1800 BC, Phoenicia was invaded by the Egyptians and was kept under Egyptian control until 1400 BC. Legend has it that at the end of the 7th century BC, the Egyptian pharaoh Necho commissioned Phoenician sailors to sail to map and circumnavigate the coast of Africa. Herodotus, a Greek traveler and geographer, described this journey 200 years later, written sometime in the 5th century BC. The Cedar is a historical entity mentioned often in the Bible and other ancient texts and played an important part in culture, trade and religious observances of ancient Middle East. Serious exploitation of these forests began in the 3rd millennium BC such as the coastal towns 
as Byblos. Over the centuries, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians made expeditions to Mount Lebanon for timber or extracted tributes of wood from the coastal cities of Cain and Phoenicia. Prized for its fragrance and durability, cedar wood became especially desirable. Cedar was imported for shipbuilding and was used for temple roofs, tomb constructions and other major buildings. The Phoenicians were famous for the manufacturing of boats. They possessed two types of fleets, a fleet of war and a fleet of trade. The maritime fleet of war was composed of 300 big warships, holding each 200 persons, rowers, pilots, combatants, as well as a large number of small warlike floats of different categories, whose total number reached 3,000 ships. The Phoenician fleet moored in Rhodes was formed of 200 floats accompanied by 200 cargo boats. Tyre, the purple dye center, was the major region for the purple dye industry. The dye was carefully extracted, a few drops at a time, from the murex, a shellfish found in the shallow and deep waters off Tyre and Sidon. The purple dye murex lives in both shallow and deep waters and feeds on dead fish and sea cucumbers. In breeding season, large numbers of females congregate and produce common egg mass, which looks like a large yellow sponge. The process used to extract the fluid is so difficult and so expensive that only the rich could afford to buy the dyed fabric. It is because of this Phoenician fabric that we still use the expressions the mad lust for the purple and born to the purple to mean to one who was born rich. Byblos became a highly developed urban settlement and economic power during the third millennium before Christ. Served by two ports, the city was protected inland by a massive defensive wall which enclosed an extensive residential area. Two large sanctuaries, known as the L-shaped building and the temple of the Lady of Byblos, were its principal places of worship. They yielded the most important artistic documents of this period, such as the characteristic pottery with geometric decorations. The importance of Byblos for Egypt is confirmed by the fact that the city appears in the myth of Isis, who comes there looking for the body of Osiris cast into the sea by Seth. The temple of the Phoenician god of healing, Eshmun, later identified with the Greek god, Asclepius, rises on a slope south of Al-Awali. Joseph Gelardon made the first mention of this site in modern times in a letter to Ernest Renan in 1861. The temple was partly excavated in 1901 by Macrae de Bray at the head of an Ottoman archaeological mission. In addition to potsherds and fragments of Greco-Roman saturday, Macrae Bay uncovered several broken marble statues of children and fragments of Phoenician inscriptions, possibly dedications to the god of healing of Sidon, Eshmun. Fragments of these statuettes were purposely broken off after dedication to the god of healing and then cast into a sacred canal in the temple enclosure. The Phoenician inscription tells us that the child was the king of Sidon. The earliest archaeological documentation for the Phoenician colonization of Malta dates back to the late 8th and early 7th century BC. In the case of Gozo, the earliest material evidence from the island is datable to the 7th to the 6th century BC. This does not necessarily reflect the earliest settlements but rather their consolidation and development to the level of permanent stable colonies. 
At first, the Phoenician mariners presumably limited themselves to the utilization of the island as a port of gradual installation of small groups of colonists living in simple conditions. This would hardly have left any appreciable archaeological traces for at least a number of decades. It is not yet possible to say what the relations between the local inhabitants of the late Bronze Age and the early Phoenician colonists were like. Nevertheless, the earliest contacts do not appear to precede the 8th century BC. This is suggested by data obtained from the excavations carried out by an Italian archaeological mission from the University of Rome at Tassilj in Marsaschlok. At Tassilj, four distinct phases of occupation have been identified, namely prehistoric, Phoenician Punic, Roman and Byzantine. The remains of a sanctuary dedicated to the Phoenician goddess Astarte, assimilated with Hera by the Greeks and with Juno by the Romans, were identified on evidence of a numerous dedication to the deity incised on pieces of broken pottery, stone, ivory and bone. The celebrated Roman orator Cicero and the temple of Hera, cited by the Greek geographer Claudius Ptolemaeus, otherwise known as Ptolemy, mentioned the identification of the Astarte sanctuary at Tassilj with that of the temple of Juno. This sanctuary, dating back in origin to the early 7th, if not the 8th century BC, incorporated the remains of a Copper Age megalithic temple, that is, 3000 to 2500 BC, with alterations and additions made for the purpose of adapting it to the exigencies of the Phoenician cult. Punic influence on Malta spans from circa 900 BC into the Roman period to about the 2nd century AD. The tombs suggest a period of political and cultural stability, despite the turmoil that befell other Punic strongholds such as Carthage. In 1924, Bellanti had identified three types of tomb development. Satemi Zamit had identified four types of tomb architecture by 1928. In her study, The Archaeology of Punic Malta, published in 2002, Claudia Sagona identified 10 types of tomb architecture, split up into different phases. Till now, Punic tombs have been found in 22 localities in Malta and Gozo. Sagona suggests that the presence of tombs in areas not close to obvious habitation sites are likely to point to ancient roads, like, for example, Kospikwa to Zabbar, to the Bay of Marsaskala, or Kospikwa to Lua, that is flanked by tomb clusters. Other possibilities include Rabat to Aintufirha, Imjar to Salina Bay, and Rabat to Salina Bay. Four types of sarcophagi have been identified. A remarkable rectangular wooden coffin that imitated a wooden chest was recovered from R. Barca. This chest was made from juniper and Aleppo pine. The fine terracotta anthropomorphic sarcophagus from a tomb at R. Barca, limits of Rabat, was also discovered in 1797 and dates back to the early 5th century BC. The style is Egyptianizing a characteristic of Phoenician Punic art. The lid was fastened by means of fitted clamps, probably of lead, inserted into dovetailed cavities at the back of the head, at the sides and at the feet. Caruana indicates that the coffin was female and makes note of the beauty and precision of work. A few stone coffins have been found in tombs in Malta and Gozo, they are usually built against the rear of the chamber from large slabs of split stone. One lead sarcophagus was found at Tamerchla. Interesting enough is the comparison with the sarcophagus of King Tabnit of Sidon, 
and other anthropoid sarcophagi from Ain al Helwa, present today at Beirut National Museum. Within the limits of the headland called Benaisa, a tomb was found in 1761, which attracted the attention of scholars for the inscription concerning Hannibal. According to Sir William Drummond, he had no doubt that the tomb was that of none other than the incomparable Hannibal. The inscription was unearthed from a field called Talbera, which means lightning in Maltese, and is the same word as the Punic patronomic of Hannibal Barca. All that emerges from Hannibal's tomb is the possibility that the great soldier was brought back for burial in his birthplace, on the perimeter of what was a British airfield. The most important monument dating from Carthaginian times is the inscription found on the marble pedestals of two ex voto candelabra found in Marsashlok temple in 1694. One of these was presented to Louis XIV of France by Grand Master de Rohan and now is in the Louvre in Paris, while the other is in the National Museum in Valletta. The famous Chippus, the Rosetta Stone of Punic Studies, bears an inscription in Greek and Phoenician. Abe Barthamley of Paris was able to decipher it and reconstruct the Phoenician alphabet, which had long been forgotten. At Zuri, there is a remarkable architectural structure now incorporated into a private house. It consists of a massive well fitted ashlar masonry laid without mortar, a feature which recalls to mind a statement by the Sicilian Greek Diodorus Siculus, who flourished between 80 and 20 BC that local buildings were well constructed and decorated with carved cornices. The Frenchman Jean Huel first described the edifice in the 18th century, who also drew a plan and an illustration of the structure showing its state of preservation at the time. In 1909, the German archaeologist Albert Meyer who published a photograph of its surviving part, noted it. Six years later, in 1915, Thomas Ashby of the British School of Rome, who considered it to be the remains of a pre-Roman building, probably a country house of the Phoenician period, also noted it. Professor Anthony Frendo, an expert in this field, also gave us his views on this rather important period in Maltese history. The Phoenicians, who were practically a Semitic race coming from the eastern part of the Mediterranean, that is, from the very heart of Lebanon, arrived in Malta around 700 years before Christ. The Phoenicians had an extensive influence on the Maltese islands, because one should say that before the arrival of the Phoenicians, the Maltese islands were still in their prehistory. This means that no writings were being exercised. There is no clear evidence of any writings taking place during those times before the Phoenicians came to Malta. After the arrival of the Phoenicians, one can observe inscriptions written in this Semitic language that is the Phoenician, and therefore one can state that one of the largest impacts exercised and given by the Phoenicians is the development of writing on the islands. Thus the Maltese islands passed from prehistory to the history stage. And one should also add, the use of this Semitic language in the Maltese islands was indeed one of the greatest induced assets. Today we still bear a language with Semitic roots. The Phoenicians also brought with them and promoted the utility commercial activities. They can be regarded as excellent businessmen of the Mediterranean during those times. Malta's strategic position at the center of the Mediterranean served as a commercial hub between East and West, between Malta and Sicily, from Sicily to Sardinia, and also with Carthage, where the Phoenicians of Carthage resided, also called Carthaginians. Another important aspect that the Phoenicians left in the Maltese islands is the use of coins as currency means. 
These coins were first used in the Maltese islands during the Phoenician Punic period. The use of ashlar stonemasonry was also adopted in the Maltese islands. This involved the carving of stone blocks, which was left amongst the locals to be used for the building and construction purposes. One should also mention that the Phoenicians were regarded as peaceful traders by the locals. It is estimated that they spent at least 500 years in the Maltese islands. The Phoenicians will be regarded as bringing over beautiful artistic artifacts as well as a heritage of Semitic mentality in language as well as in culture. The beautiful ornamental pieces left by the Phoenicians can be witnessed in the collection at the National Museum of Archaeology. With the steady decline of the Phoenician motherland in the Levant under the Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian empires, Carthage itself, originally a Phoenician foundation on the North African coast near Tunis, took over the hegemony of other Phoenician colonies in the West. It seems that the islands enjoyed a period of quiet prosperity until the 3rd century BC, when Carthage clashed with Rome in a series of Punic wars for supremacy in the central and western Mediterranean. Apart from the archipelago's possible strategic function in the earliest period of colonization, that is in the late 8th and 7th century BC, for controlling shipping routes in the Channel of Sicily and its subsequent involvement in war events, Malta's part in the First and Second Punic War is mentioned by ancient historians. The great military leaders of the war for Carthage were Hamilcar Barca and his sons, Hasdrubal and Hannibal. Hannibal was born in 247 BC, presumably in Carthage itself, the eldest of three brothers. Although there is a legend which gives Malta as his birthplace according to Britzi. Rome's outstanding leaders were Scipio Africanus and his adopted grandson Scipio Aemilianus. The first war between 264 and 241 BC saw Rome fighting to break the growing hold of Carthage on the chain of islands that enabled it to control the western Mediterranean. The second war between 218 and 201 BC pitted the ambitions of two commercial powers, the initial area of conflict being Sicily. It was during the Second Punic War in the year 218 BC the Roman fleet embarked towards the Maltese islands under the consul Titus Sempronius Longus. They sailed from Lilibium, Marsala in Sicily towards Malta. The Carthaginians under the leadership of Hamilcar bin Gisgo numbered around 2,000 warriors, but were outnumbered by the Roman forces. Thus the Carthaginians surrendered the Maltese islands to the Romans. Carthage lost all political and military power by the end of the Second Punic War. The last war lasted between 149 and 146 BC. This was the final desperate attempt of Carthage to preserve its freedom.
the Romans went from house to house, slaughtering the Carthaginians. Survivors were sold into slavery, the city and harbor were destroyed, and the Romans poured salt over the land to ensure its barrenness. The Maltese islands passed permanently under the domination of Rome and were annexed to the province of Sicily. After the siege of Tyre in 332 BC, the Phoenician Empire dwindled, and in 64 BC, the name of Phoenicia disappeared entirely, becoming part of the Roman province of Syria. Phoenician cultural traditions were slow to disappear and were indeed so deeply entrenched that they remained evident well into the Roman period to the third and fourth century after Christ, as witnessed by St. Paul, where he found a barbaric race that did not speak Latin or Greek, but Punic. Mm -hmm.